Right, um, I think we're all here, so I will get started. So we're, we're going to talk now, today, and for the next lecture about how to search for actions on Earth via their interactions with standard model particles. Um, so we're leaving, we're leaving astrophysics um, for cosmology structure formation essentially behind, and we're going to talk about what axioms actually do um, other um, things other than gravity. <laughs> Um, so I want to start with a little bit of a little bit of a prelude, um, comparing axioms to WIMPs, which are another leading dark matter candidate. Um, if any of you've ever seen any basically any talk about WIMPs ever before, um, this is the this is the plot you will be shown. So this is the WIMP nucleon cross section versus the WIMP mass, and all the regions above the curves are excluded by various experiments. And there's this so-called neutrino floor at the bottom where it's thought that you can't, if, if WIMPs were lived down there, you couldn't detect them because you couldn't tell the difference between a WIMP and a neutrino. Um, if you were writing down a WIMP model, um, you know, the first person to realize WIMPs could be dark matter, and you did this in the 70s, and you just equated the um, annihilation cross-section with the nucleon cross-section, worked out the WIMP relic density, you would have thought that they sat up here. WIMP interacts via the weak force in the canonical models, therefore via the Z, and if it had an order one coupling, it would sit up here. So the kind of canonical WIMP um, was excluded long ago, but there are of course many different ways that the WIMPs, the WIMPs can be produced and can be um, coupled to the standard model. They could couple via the Higgs portal or via the, or, or via the Z portal, but with a smaller coupling. But and um, these were, you know, the original WIMP of the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and and, and there's these, all these really strong constraints. WIMPs, of course, could live at lower masses, but they're much harder to find in direct detection. Um, higher masses, this curve just carries on. You're kind of, there's this famous Susie scan um, of WIMPs that predicts a region in this parameter space in minimal, minimal Susie. And there's an important region of minimal Susie just below the current constraints where WIMPs could still live and were predicted to live um, some time ago. But the point of this part is that lots of natural WIMP parameter space has been constrained. Um, but the situation is really, really different with axions. This is the equivalent plot for axions. The axion predictions in the 1970s and 1980s of the KSVZ and DFS, DFSZ models live here. And all the colored regions in this plot are excluded. So axions are not, like the canonical model, this line here is the equivalent of the Z portal G equals one line for WIMPs. Axions are really, and this prediction hasn't changed. There are no new models on this plot. This prediction has been the same since the 1980s. And we haven't made any headway in constraining it. And, the, and, and you know, that, that's, that's our fault. We need to work better and come up with new experiments to constrain axions. And that's what we're going to talk about throughout the whole rest of the next two lectures. The only experiment to have made significant headway in constraining the QCD axion is this experiment called ADMX, which we will um, discuss at so, in, in some length. But it's very narrow band. So we need lots and lots of new ideas to cover this region and this region and try and exclude this classic line of axions, because they could live anywhere along that line, basically going from about um, one electron volt um, up to about um, the, where the black hole super radiance constraints kick in that we talked about last time, at somewhere about 10 to the minus 10 EV. So really we've got about 10 orders of magnitude to cover with experiments. The future, however, it does look pretty bright. And um, so this is um, like looking ahead to what we'll see in the course of the next two lectures. This is the um, forecast for what the future could look like in about, let's say, the next 10 to 20 years for axion detection. So now we see the same constraints, but now all the lightly shaded red regions are experiments that are proposed. Some of them are already under construction. Some of them already have preliminary results, and we'll talk about all of them. And um, we've got experiments like Mad Max, um, the topological insulated experiment I, I've been working on, optical halo scopes, abracadabra, extension stradium X haystack, 
um, the experiments in, in Korea, all kinds of things. So this picture will change dramatically in the next 10 to 20 years. And then axioms will be in the same situation, I think, that WIMPs are already today. So, so the WIMP experiments have made incredible progress, but they haven't found anything. Axioms need to make just as much progress um, and so that we're in the same situation. So we've ruled out our benchmark models. Can I ask, what is this equation if you're very heavy? Um, so if you're, very, if you're heavier than, um, say, an EV, you come into these um, stellar constraints and you also, the, the lifetime of the axion becomes too long and um, too short sometimes. We'll talk about this. Um, you also run into um, some collider constraints, uh, heavier masses, and above about an EV, the axion is no longer uh, well produced by vacuum realignment. Now the thermal production takes over and you become hot dark matter. So you're not a good dark matter candidate above about one EV either. Um, but axioms do exist all the way up, and we'll talk about some of those heavier ones in collider searches and things. But the dark matter axion pretty much has to be lighter than about one EV. And as we saw from black hole super radiance, if it's a QCD axion, it has to be heavier than about 10 to minus 10 EV. So it really is bounded um, from both sides. Okay, so um, here's some selected reading on these axion searches, and I'll get started with the main body of the talk. So to talk about detecting axions, we need to talk about couplings. We built the QCD axion model um, already in lecture one, and these are the couplings that it has at low energy. So phi is the axion field. It has a coupling to FF dual of electromagnetism. This is through the, the equivalent, the anomaly that we wrote down um, again in lecture one um, with the photon. The gluon anomaly term, when you go down to low energies after the QCD phase transition, manifests as this dipole coupling. We'll talk about this again in a few slides time. But this is a coupling between a nucleon fermion field, um, sigma is some combination of gamma matrices and F mu nu. So it's a coupling between the nucleons and the electric, and the electric field. This is the electric dipole moment. And then we have these, these um, axial fermion current couplings, again, that we wrote down um, from the Petrae Brinton symmetry um, after, after symmetry breaking and coming from the fermion kinetic term. Okay, so all of these couplings, it's important to notice, have some inverse mass dimension, and thus they have to scale with one over the axial decay constant. So when the axial decay constant goes up, the couplings go down. This is generic, and I'll show some um, examples of this. So the lower mass axions are more weakly coupled. That's why that line on that plot falls away. So the lower mass axions are harder to find because they have weaker couplings. Um, okay, so at low energies, after the petro symmetry breaking, after the QCD phase transition, after the electroweak phase transition, the axion can couple to electromagnetism by E dot B, nucleon electric dipole moments, and fermion chiral points. Oh, I think my, my slides have gone a bit funny here. So the uh, axion EM coupling, this is the classic axion coupling, and it has ma um, inverse mass dimension one. It takes the following form, uh, G, G phi gamma over four phi F, F phi FF dual. If you work out what this is in terms of the normal fields, it's phi E dot B. And the coupling is defined in the following way. It's the, um, the fine structure constant of electromagnetism, 1 over 137 in natural units, divided by 2 pi, times Fa over the color anomaly, times some um, dimensionless constant C, which you can compute. So dimensionless constant C is the bare electromagnetic anomaly, what you would get from the loops with two photons coming out the other end. Action goes in, loop of fermions, two photons comes out. This, that's where this funny F over C um, comes in here. So you see this, this is just proportional to the electromagnetic anomaly. And then there's a term here that comes from the color anomaly itself. Uh, this term here is, so due to the color anomaly, the action interaction with gluons, um, it can mix with pions and it can mix with the Z. And then after 
and electron weak symmetry breaking and QCD, and QCD symmetry breaking, you end up with this term from mixing with the Z. So yeah, that's what I just said. The M anomaly, I'm mixing with the Z caused by the color anomaly. So, so the QCD actually has to have this coupling because it has to have non-zero color on it has to have non-zero color anomaly in order to solve the, the strong CD problem. And you can calculate this constant in the, in the classic QCD axion models, and it has these values. What, minus 1.92 for KSVZ and 0.75 for DFSC. You're only sensitive to the absolute value of this coupling, so the KSVZ models are more strongly coupled than the, than the DFSC models but there's not much in it. That's why they're drawn as this standard band. Okay. This coupling allows the axion to do a few things that we'll talk about. It can decay to two photons. So you can have a process like this. Phi goes to two photons just straight away. Uh, you can work out the decay rate for this process just from the square of this matrix element. And it has the following form. It's 130 seconds times the mass of GV over the mass cubed times the coupling in these units. Um, so you see that if we go down to axion masses relevant for dark matter, so like 10 to the minus six EV, this time scale becomes much longer than the age of the universe. It's only significant for very massive axions. Axions can also convert into a photon if you have a background magnetic field so you just turn one of these photon lines around and imagine it's being provided as a virtual photon um, in some background magnetic field. Then the diagram looks like this. Here's your B, here's your coupling, and you just turn into one photon. This, this is called the inverse Primakov process, and this B can be provided either by some field that you apply in your experiment or by the magnetic field of, of some nucleon or something. So, this um, can enhance your axion convert. This is conversion and this is the K. This classic term, this E dot B, we can also look at it um, in classical field theory. It just modifies Maxwell's equations. And it's really nice, you can play lots of games with modified Maxwell's equations. So as long as the axion field is dynamical, as long as it has non-zero gradients, what was a total derivative, so this theta E dot B, theta is a constant, E dot B is a total derivative, and it, this doesn't appear in Maxwell's equations. But if theta, the axion, is allowed to have gradients, then it does appear in Maxwell's equation. So you have a new source for the divergence of E, which goes like the gradient of A. You also have, uh, this should be the A by the T on here. Yeah, you also have a new source for curl B that goes like the A by the T. So if we have a background axion field provided by the dark matter, we know that dark matter is just the axion field which oscillates at the axion frequency. We now have new sources for Maxwell's equations. So you can see these you know, conversion and decay processes in the classical equations of motion. So I apply some B field, say here, then my gradients of A, axial momentum, will source an electric field. Things like this. This is, the, this is what the basis of many of the searches, modifications for Maxwell's equations. And then, of course, we've got the axial equation of motion itself, box minus m squared a. This is also sourced by, any, by anything with e dot b. So if you make a source with e dot b, you'll also produce axions. So this tells you how to produce axions and how to turn axions into electric and magnetic fields. I'd like to spend more time talking about axial electrodynamics, but I don't have time. Next, we've got to, I'm going to go through the couplings, then go through how we actually search for them. Okay, so now let's talk about the dipole moment coupling, the axial EDM coupling. This is the, this is the one that I wrote down, GD, uh, phi, n bar, sigma mu nu, n, f mu nu. This is the thing that solves the strong CP problem. The axion couples to the EDM, the axion field oscillates about its vacuum value of zero, thus the EDM um, oscillates around zero. EDM is not zero, but it oscillates around zero with a very small amplitude. So the, mag the, the mass dimension of this coupling, the way I wrote it, is inverse mass squared. And as I said, the, the EDM oscillates. And I've just taken my expression for the EDM from lecture one and substituted in 
theta, theta is equal to phi over f cosine mt. Okay, so the EDM oscillates at cosine mt. I've taken reference values here for a fuzzy dark matter because as we'll see at the end of next lecture, you can actually use the oscillations of the EDM to search for fuzzy dark matter. So it just has this form. GD is the value of the EDM that you found um, that we wrote down in lecture one, measured in EDM units, E centimeters, divided by the decay constant FA. So then you convert E centimeters into natural units and it, and it has this, this value. 3.7 times 10 to minus 19 inverse GEV squared, then times 10 to the 16 GEV over F. So you have oscillations of the dipole moment. For 10 to minus 22 EV, this is a frequency of um, about 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 7 hertz. So the EDM would oscillate on approximately year time scales. As you bring the axion mass up to the QCD um, value, the oscillations of the EDM happen on uh, gigahertz or terahertz scales. Okay, and this is the basis of the nuclear magnetic resonance searches for axions, um, which we'll also talk about next lecture. Okay, so before I get on to the um, kind of classic experiments to search for axions, I'll do a few benchmarks. They're less, they're less relevant for dark matter axions, um, but, they're, but they're, they're important to talk about. Okay, so axion decays. If the axion is heavy, if it has a mass of about a GeV, then we saw that the decay rate, uh, the, decay, the decay time is about 130 seconds. That's a few minutes. We all know Weinberg's famous book, The First Three Minutes. BBN happens on minute time scales. So if your axion is about a GeV, it's going to decay during BBN. Any extra source of energy during BBN spoils the predictions of BBN. So you better, better not have things around during BBN that are decaying. This is expressed in, in these constraints from a really nice paper by um, Malaya in 2015. So here is the constraint on the decay time. So he's absorbed, um, so you remember the decay time is a function of the decay constant, the axiom decay constant and the axiom mass. He switched that around to write constraints on decay time <laughs> versus mass. And this is the, how it changes the prediction in BBN for the, uh, deuterium abundance, the helium abundance, the lithium abundance, and the effective number of relativistic species, which we again talked about a few lectures ago. So here you go. Here's the change in the prediction for the helium abundance. We know the helium abundance is about 2.25. So the helium abundance is going to exclude all of these regions where it becomes too large. Similarly, we need to get all of these things right. And N effective had better not be much larger than um, much smaller than three, so here axion production dilutes N effective. So N effective tells you here N effective 3.04, you'd better sit down here at pretty large masses. So here the axion can't be dark matter because it decays during BBN, but the axion, the axion like particles could live down here at you know, GV-ish masses with very short lifetimes. And this is now the combination of all of those constraints. Um, again, from Malaya. So you see that the, all these BBN constraints plus things from um, the CMB, uh, plus things from Supernova 1987A, beam dump experiments. Um, these all force the axion like part, the heavy axion like particle to be very heavy, GEV, and have short lifetimes. You can, of course, look for heavy GEV like things with short lifetimes at the LHC. So you can look for axion like particles at the LHC. And I'm, I'm not a, a collider phenomenologist, so I'm just going to show you the plot. Um, this is from a, a review by uh, Andrea Tam. Um, Andrea, Andrea and I did our undergraduate together, so I, I like saying that she's working on axions now. Um, and she's a, yeah, a part, part, particle phenom um, colliders person. So this is a combination of constraints uh, from colliders, from Andrea, from Andrea, so you have this, um, you can have a Higgs going in, a fermion loop, your axion couples to fermions via this loop, and, the, and then it also couples to Z, so you get Higgs, Higgs to Z axion, and this same loop for the axion gives you D 
the electromagnetic anomaly. So she's been able to express these constraints in terms of the axion mass and the axion two photon coupling. So here's all the constraints. This is the axion mass in GV. So the dark matter axions are 10 to the minus nine GV and below. They're here. We've got these cast constraints, which we're going to talk about. Um, we've got stellar constraints, which we'll talk about. Horizontal branch stars, these constraints go away at a few hundred kV, but above those masses, above those masses where all, everything else we'll talk about um, runs out, constraints from heat to Z axion come in. So you start to rule out axion like particles in the GV and super GV range up to a TV from these processes that are not observed at the LHC. So it's very nice to kind of connect axions to, to Higgs physics. And of course you can have axion-like particles above a TV because we don't know anything about the spectrum of, of, of the universe above a TV. But they would not be dark matter. <laughs> uh, the next uh, nice thing that um, we need to discuss is axion-mediated forces. So this was first discussed in a paper by Moody and Wilczek in 1984. <laughs> so the axion fermion interaction mediates spin-dependent long-range forces. So here's your Feynman diagram, fermion I, scattering of fermion J by the exchange of an axion, and the momentum transfer in this, in this interaction is Q. And the fermion couplings, G I, G J for fermion I and fermion J, I'll point out again, they have inverse mass dimension, they scale at one over the axion of the K constant. We want to work out how we can observe this, so you can look for macroscopic forces between objects, but you need to then work out what the potential is. So um, you work out the macroscopic potential by taking the matrix element for this process, M of, M of Q, the momentum transfer Q, take that in the, in the non-relativistic limit, work out what all your fermion bilinears and things are in the non-relativistic limit, and take its Fourier transform. And that gives you the real space potential V of R. So you can do that, and you get this nasty looking expression here for the, for the potential. But the important things for us are proportional to GIGJ, that's just from the matrix elements. It's proportional to one over the fermion masses, MIMJ. That's just from the expression here. And then it's got all this nasty dependence. But it has one over R to some power, balanced by the correct power of the mass. So when it's one over, when it's one over R cubed, it's one over mass here, we don't need powers of the mass. One over R squared, you need one power of the mass, etc. Uh, the sigmas here, tell you that it's spin dependent. Sigma is just the vector, the unit vector along the direction of the fermion spin, in this case. And it has the classic Yukawa um, suppression. So we all know that um, forces mediated by a massive particle fall off on distances larger than the particle Compton wavelength by the classic Yukawa suppression. So it's a Yukawa suppressed spin dependent force. And you can search for that. You can get two lumps of matter, you can spin polarize them, and you can try and measure if there's, an, if there's a force between them. No such force is observed, and you can bound the, and you can bound the values of, of these couplings. So for example, the, the, the um, Ertwash, um, Washington torsion balance, and um, uh, potassium three helium magnetometers um, can bound this. So for sufficiently small axion masses, such as this force is sufficiently long range, um, you can place a bound on the axion fermion coupling. Uh, it tends to has to be less than 10 to minus four inverse GV. Remember that this thing is order of magnitude, one over F, one over the decay constant. This is not a very strong bound. It only tells you the decay constant has got to be larger than 10 to the four GV. We already knew that to get the right dark matter abundance, the decay constant had to be larger than about 10 to the nine GV. So this is not a very strong bound, but it's an important bound, particularly because you can enhance this effect using a resonance. So there's a proposed experiment called Ariadne. Ariadne was proposed by um, Mina Rabinataki and um, Garachi in 2014. Um, it's so here they have a, an NMR sample and a rotating mass. So the rotating mass is a scalar, and the NMR sample is, um, has some polarization. So they probe, um, and they can also polarize the mass. 
they can probe the dipole-dipole or monopole-dipole interaction. The axion, as well as this dipole-dipole interaction, has a monopole-dipole interaction because of some CP violation. And again, you can just compute the magnitude, look it up somewhere. And what they do is they match the frequency of rotation of the um, mass to the frequency of oscillation uh, to this frequency MA here, the frequency at which the axion is oscillating. And then this, this force becomes resonantly enhanced. And, they've, and what they thought is they can actually search for the QCD axion now with this by really enhancing the, um, enhancing the effect. So here they've got some couplings that we're, they, they're using some different conventions, dimensionless couplings, um, the scalar and dipole force. The important thing is the laboratory bound that I just showed you is this blue region which is way inside the astrophysical and experimental bounds that we'll talk about in a few slides time. The, the uh, prediction of the QCD axion model is down here. So force range is, so now the axion the K constant goes along on the top um, instead of the axion mass, which would go the other way. Anyway, this is the QCD prediction, QCD axion prediction in blue. And they think that they're in their red bands, they could just make some headway and searching for the QCD axion <laughs> in the kind of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 GV, the K constant range. This is not something that can be searched for by many direct detection experiments. And then if they just say, what is the best we could do with the quantum, with some quantum limited magnetometer, they think they could maybe even carve out all of the um, QCD axion parameter space. It's a pretty promising um, proposal. And the good news is, actual experiments are getting built all over the world at the moment. So this experiment is getting built, um, and it's getting built at the Center for Axion Precision Physics in Daejeon in Korea. These guys are building a whole load of axion experiments. We'll see some more of them later in this lecture. Um, so, so this is getting built in Korea. It's under R&D at the moment. This is just some update from um, Garachi and the Korean group on what's going on. They're starting to build their rotating mass. They're starting to build their squid they've got real you know cad proper engineering drawings of how this is going to be built rather than this cartoon from their paper five years ago so very exciting ariadne is going to happen and maybe and if they can get it to work it might be able to search for the qcd axiom nice thing about spin dependent forces is they don't depend on the axiom being around right this is exchange of virtual axions you don't need the axiom to be dark matter here the axion dark matter density could be really, really small. You know, these small decay constants, if the production from strings is small, dark matter density could be you know, sub percent um, in this range, but you don't care about that for searching for spin dependent forces because it's exchange of a virtual particle. So really nice, really promising getting built. Okay, the next kind of benchmark that we need to discuss um, before we get on to uh, the more um, the main focus, which is direct searches. We need to talk about stellar cooling. So this is another <laughs> really important um, yeah, benchmark for axion photon coupling or axion anything coupling. You can translate these bounds into a bound and <laughs> coupling of the axion. So axions can be produced inside stars. So the, now you've got a new way for a star to lose energy. So the, the nuclei you know, interact and they produce things, they produce photons and neutrinos that escape from the star and cool it down. If they can also produce axions, the star can emit axions and cool via this, via this new channel. So you can compute the luminosity um, in axions, LA, um, and, this, and this is allowed to happen as long as the action is lighter than the internal temperature of the star. Internal temperatures of stars are tens to hundreds of KV. That's why in the plot, um, earlier from Andrea Tan, none of the star, all the stellar bounds disappear um, at large masses because stars just aren't hot enough to make, make axions. But in the whole range of, that we're interested in for dark matter axions, they're light enough to be produced inside stars. So they are. And this is the luminosity. The luminosity in axions is 10 to the minus 3 times a solar luminosity times this um, ratio of the coupling, 10 to, 10 to the 10 inverse GeV, which should be here. Um, okay, so very roughly you can just say, well, the, the sun has a solar luminosity. 
in ordinary particles. So it better hadn't have, have more than a total luminosity and axion, then we would have noticed this order one. So you can just say, okay, write down what value of G would make this one. There, there's, your, there's your coupling constraint. Very rough, but of course we can do better than that. Um, we can do better than that by looking at horizontal branch stars. So the production of axions shortens the lifetime of the stars. They cool more quickly. And that stellar evolution models without axions, stellar evolution models with, or, with all the ordinary particles of the standard model are very good and make accurate predictions. They particularly make accurate predictions for the ratio R of horizontal branch stars to red giant branch stars in globular clusters. Um, and, and these people in this paper, et al. Et al. Um, said, okay, so they just stuck this new cooling channel with axions into, stellar, into, or into standard stellar evolution codes and computed how this ratio depends on the axion coupling. And they give the following fit. So axions modify this process of so R is 6.26 times the helium abundance minus 0.12. This is the standard um, prediction minus 0.41 times the axion, can the axion coupling squared measured in the units here in 10 to the 10 inverse GV, so G10 squared. So now you can use this to just kind of to read off some constraints. So um, in this paper, they also collected the measurements of R in 39 globular clusters. And they say that R is equal to 1.39, obviously with some errors. And we know the helium abundance, um, it's measured in astrophysics. It can also be inferred from combinations of CB, CMB and BBN measurements, and it's about 0.25 helium abundance. And, and you can use this to, read, to work out a constraint on the axion photon coupling. So at 95% confidence limit for axions less than about 100 keV, the bound is 6.6 times 10 to the minus 11 inverse GV, and this is a very important baseline, um, which, are, which we, you'll see on all, I, I'll talk a lot about this coupling, and you'll see this horizontal branch star limit sitting there all the time as the thing to beat. Of course, you know, it's not as statistically, say, rigorous as um, bounds that you can get on Earth. So, you, you know, astrophysical bounds are always order of magnitude when it comes to these things, but it's a really important baseline. And this is the main one uh, from this paper that discusses it. Uh, something I haven't got a slide on, um, but I realized I should mention, is I said, okay, stellar evolution models with, without axions accurately predict things. There is, one, there is one case that people talk about where they don't do so well, and maybe you actually need axions to explain the data. And this is in uh, the cooling of white dwarfs. So, so, so white dwarf stars um, seem to have some anomalous cooling mechanism. They're not perfectly fit by the standard stellar evolution codes. And they can be better fit if you include an axion with a mass of about 10 to the minus three electron volts, about millev if it couples to electrons. If the axions couple to electrons in the right way, then they can allow extra cooling inside these white dwarfs and possibly improve the fit to the data. Of course, stellar evolution is a complicated subject, so maybe we're just missing something in standard stellar evolution, um, or maybe there's a different type of particle, not an axion that can explain this different new particle. But you can improve the fits with an axion coupling to electrons. So, but unfortunately not on the QCD axion line. So, so it's not a normal QCD axion, it's, more strongly coupled to electrons than the DFSD model would be, for example. So DFSD has a tree level coupling to electrons. You go, okay, maybe it's DFSD. It's not. It's more strongly coupled than that. Um, but it's a nice um, phenomenon, and it's, a, it's also something that will be tested by some of the next generation experiments that I'll talk about. Really? Yes? Why is mass dependent? And not only depending on the coupling? Um, I don't recall. I don't recall. You would think, yeah, as long as you're less than 100 kV, you can be made inside the star. Similar to that, where it's only depending on the coupling. Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't recall. Yeah, you would think it's just anything less than 100 kV would do. Mm. Maybe it's like in the context of some QCD-like model where you tie the coupling to the decay constant in some way. So you're not the QCD axiom, but you're still, you still tie the two in some way, or you demand that you get the dark matter abundance as well or something like that. There must be some additional constraint that fixes the mass. And then those fixed. Yeah, I, sh I, should have had a I should have had a slide on that. Um, you can find the references, I'm sure. Okay, so now we've done a whole bunch of baseline um, constraints and the very exciting new possibility of Ariadne. Um, I'm now going to go through the, the kind of three, four classic axion searches that you'll see discussed in every review. And the things that gave us all of those colored regions on the plot in, um, in slide two. So the, the, or what, were, what were all those colored regions that searched for axions there that gave us all our current best limits in the laboratory? So these are the classics. Okay, so the first classic is light shining through a wall. Light shining through a wall works in the following way with the axion conversion into photons in the presence of matter. It was proposed way back in 1987 by Carl van Bibbeck and collaborators. And it's been realized in the lab by Oscar and Alps One. Um, so I'll just draw the Feynman diagram uh, for those here. So you shine a laser at a wall. Lasers can't go through walls because they've, um, they've got really high refractive indices or something like this. But what you can do instead, you can apply a magnetic field outside the wall like this. Then the, then the photon turns into an axion. Axions interact really, really weakly with standard model stuff, so they just go straight through your wall. You then apply another magnetic field outside your wall. And turn the axion back into the photon, which you measure with some detector. So you shine your laser and your thing that it shouldn't go through. If you've got to a magnetic field applied, it might be able to go through it with some probability. This process, of course, involves two powers of the axion photon coupling. So it's suppressed by two powers of the coupling. Um, but you can observe this process and try and set a limit on the axion photon coupling or even measure it by observing, so here, they're producing their photons with some high-powered laser. They've got some wall here where they apply magnets. So they've got some superconducting magnet as their wall. And then on the other side, they're trying to detect the photons, so laser photons detectors. Um, so this experiment has been done by Oscar and Alps One. And yeah, the, the advantage again, like the axion mediated forces, is the axion doesn't have to be dark matter in this case. And did any photon and any particle that couples to e.b will do. That's what ALPS stands for. Any light particle search, you can use it to search for many other things as well as axions. And the nice thing about this is there's also upgrade, there's also an upgrade to this um, experiment plan that's called ALPS 2, and it's under commissioning at Daisy um, near Hamburg at the moment. So they're using old um, magnets from the HERA um, collider to make a new version of this. There are also ways to resonantly enhance this process um, with a proposal called Jura, I believe, which may get built at CERN in the, in the coming decades. And these are the constraints that it gives you. So here is um, our plane that we'll see many times of the axion photon coupling versus axion mass. Axion mass here between 10 to minus eight and one EV or so. Written this down as frequencies, about so gigahertz, terahertz, etc. Here's the QCD axion predictions of the FSD and KSPZ. Here's our horizontal branch stars limit, which forces the axion to be lighter than about an EV to be the dark matter. And here are the bounds from light shining through a wall. Alps and Oscar. <coughs> they don't really do very much. They don't get outside the horizontal branch stars limit. 
However, the upgrade ALPS 2 will get outside the limit set by horizontal branch stars. And, J and Jura um, would do even better by maybe a couple of orders of magnitude. But they don't get down to the QCD axion line. But they search for axion like particles with couplings just below the limit set by horizontal branch stars. The next classic axion search is called a helioscope. So the helioscope was proposed in a, pa in a paper of 1983 by Sakivi. He also proposed the halo scopes that we'll talk about later. That's where he gave them these corresponding names. This experiment has also been done. What does it do? <laughs> so it also doesn't rely on the axions being dark matter. So again, nice. Kind of like the, um, it's related to like shining through a wall, but you only need one power of the axion photon coupling. So here, axions are produced inside um, in the sun by the process that we talked about with the, with the luminosity that I wrote down a few slides ago. As long as they're less than 100 kV in mass, produced by the sun, axions come in. So now what you do is you point your magnet at the sun. So your axions come into your magnet, which you're pointing at the sun, Inside the magnet, the axions convert into photons. You observe them on the other end of your telescope. Why was this done at CERN? Because they've got loads and loads of magnets lying around. So they used LHC test magnets. Um, so the same as the ones that are in the pipe in the LHC. You get one of these that's lying around spare. You point it at the sun and you hope to see axions on the other side. You don't see axions on the other side. Sorry, you hope to see photons on the other side don't see photons on the other side more than you would expect. So you use this to set a limit on the axion photon coupling. Nice and very strong limits. So you point your telescope at the sun, no observation, constraint. There is also a very exciting new proposal. It's been around for a long time actually, but it may finally get built called the International Axion Observatory. So you now build a dedicated one of these magnets in a bigger facility um, and hope to improve your bounds so you have stronger magnetic fields basically because the conversion process is proportional to the magnetic field the LXC magnets are very strong but you can make stronger ones if you build a dedicated magnet the International Action Observatory is relatively likely to get built again at DAISY so exciting place to be being right here um, so yeah DAISY may build this upgrade this is what it looks like so Okay, so here is the LHC magnet. Um, what's about the scale of a human here? Okay, so here's the control panel, right? Human, probably about so large, you can see the, the ladder. You can imagine a human standing next to this. The axo, so here's your human. Here's how big the thing will be. It's gonna be absolutely giant. Um, uh, but you know, it, it, in very, it's been planned very, very well. You know, this is in late stages of design. Um, and we really know how well it will perform if it were to get built. So here we are again on our axion photon um, plane, coupling mass. Here's our bounds from before, from like trying through a wall. Cast is now the same axion solar telescope with this bound here in purple. Very unlucky for them, they, they don't get outside the horizontal branch stars. However, the much more you know, solid, reliable constraint is in the lab. You have control over a lot of what you're um, doing. Do you have control over your statistics very well? You also understand the sun um, very, very well compared to these distant horizontal branch stars. So, you know, it's a more statistically rigorous uh, limit. And then the upgrade, um, yes? Is it working with the same process? <laughs> um, it doesn't work with the light shining through a wall process. You only need one power of the axion photon coupling. So, uh, so this is LSW helioscope and that axion comes in the photon comes out of it. And the axion here is produced by the sun. So you only need one power of the axial photon coupling in your lab. Of course, you have another one 
happening inside the soil, uh, you can produce loads of axioms in the soil. Um, so, the, the, so, the, so it's a little bit, a little bit easier because you only have one part of the coupling in the lab. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a similar process, but not exactly the same. And um, now the dotted orange line is um, an unofficial forecast. I think I, um, I can't remember where I read it off from. It's not exactly from an EAXO paper. Um, this is what the AXO will do for the axion photon coupling. So it improves over cast by almost two orders of magnitude. And the significant thing is, it gets well outside the horizontal bunch stars limit and eats significantly into the QCD axion parameter space around 0.01 EV. <laughs> so this is what we saw already in this preview of combining all of these constraints um, that I showed on slide length three. <coughs> the AXO happening in the next few years will eat into some of this parameter space, but the places where it doesn't eat are starting at, at you know, a few milli EV, doesn't make any constraint there, and leaves the rest of this dark matter parameter space open. So remember, a few milli EV is actually on the K constants of about 10 to the nine GV. Um, could well be the dark matter in these um, post-inflation symmetry breaking scenarios. The other thing to say is that true QCD axion <laughs> models like KSBZ and DFSC, because the value of the decay constant also predicts all the other couplings, like the nucleon coupling, there's a stellar bound that, that excludes the, the QCD axion models from living above about 0.01 um, EV as well. So the QCD axion proper, including the stellar constraints, only lives on the lower part of this line. But axion like particles, you know, where you can say get rid of the nucleon couplings, it could live up here. So the progress in the next few, in the coming decades, the axo will be very important and cast laid down some, you know, showed that this could be done in a precision way and gave us a really strong laboratory bound on these masses too. But the AXO and ALPS, you know, light shining through a wall and helioscopes, don't search for dark matter axions. We still haven't said anything about the dark matter axion. We've only talked about producing axions in the sun or using them as virtual exchange, things like this. We haven't talked about the axion background, this oscillating field that is, should be all around us, field oscillating at, you know, terahertz, gigahertz, all the way down to hertz, or subhets at the um, black hole super radiance bounds. What is this oscillating field um, doing and how can we search for that? How can we search for dark matter axioms? And the answer is there are lots of ways to do it. It's very different than searching for WIMPs. So I showed the WIMP searches before. WIMPs are big heavy things. They come in, they collide with the nucleus, they go away, you watch the nuclear recoil. Axions are really light. You're not going to see that process happen. They're not going to collide with nuclei. But we wrote down already the axion modification to Maxwell's equations. Axions are really, really light, and so they have really high number density of occupation. So you can just treat them as a classical background field. And this classical background field interacts with Maxwell's equations, and that's the basis of many of the searches. And in particular, it's the basis of haloscope searches. So again, these were proposed in this um, incredibly important paper by, by Pierre Sakivi. And, okay, here they are, haloscopes. What happens? You have resonant conversion of a dark matter axion into microwave photons. I'll show um, the equations of how that happens in a few slides time. <laughs> um, so you have a big cavity, a big microwave cavity, and inside this you apply a magnetic field. Now your dark matter axions come in, apply a magnetic field, they turn into photons. So it's the same, it looks like the same process as the helioscope, but now instead of the, the, the sun producing axion the KV energy, we've now got um, the, the galaxy, the, the galactic halo giving us a source of very low momentum classical field axions, which convert into photons now inside this cavity. The 
the trade-off is this is a resonant process. I should have had my slides the way around. This is a resonant process, resonant on the natural frequency of the cavity. So your cavity is naturally gigahertz. You know, bit, nice big cavity, you can build a nice big gigahertz cavity. The axions only convert inside the cavity. So you want a big cavity to get large conversion volume, but that limits the dynamic range over which you can do this. You can't build huge cavities because they need to be filled with a magnetic field. You can't build really small cavities because then the conversion volume would be small. So that's why this thing has a relatively small dynamic range. Um, you also have to do scanning. Um, I'll probably talk about this again in a few slides time. So your cavity has some natural frequency in the search for axons. There's been many such um, incarnations of cavities. This is a big field building these cavities. Um, the first ones were built in the 1980s um, in Brookhaven, in Fermi Lab, and University of Florida. Um, ADMX, the current leader in this field, um, PI there, Leslie Rosenberg, um, has been operating since 1995 and really starting to reach design efficiency only in the last five years. Design efficiency in 2010, and they have lots of upgrades planned, I'll show them. Um, Eric Lentz, who's a postdoc um, here, um, he's not here today. Eric is a member of the ADMX collaboration, did his PhD with Leslie, working on building these things and, and, and um, scanning them, analyzing the data. So, okay, here it is. It works by a, by, by a resonance, the resonance between the axial natural frequency and the natural frequency of the cavity. You know, if you just build a cavity, it's just got one frequency, you need to be able to change it. So you do that with some rods. So here's a picture of, what, of how you do the scanning. So here's your cavity. Your cavity is encircled in a solenoid to provide the magnetic field. And it's inside a big fridge to keep it all very, very cold. It has to be um, hundreds of microkelp, hundreds of millikelvin. So you keep the whole thing at helium temperatures. Then inside here, you've got a dilution refrigerator that makes the cavity itself a few hundred millikelvin. You then need a rod inside your cavity and the rod, here's the rod, here's, an, here's another rod, the rods move around and change the resonant frequency of the cavity. But the thing is, you're only sensitive to that resonant frequency narrow band on axioms. So you sit there and you wait, and then you change your frequency, and then you wait again. So that's why the, why the exclusions for these things always look like pencil beams coming down. And that's why it takes so long. If you knew the axion mass, you tune this to, to, to that frequency and you detect it within, I think Eric said before, the scans are tens of seconds. If you knew the mass, you could just detect it. So that's why people are very interested in predictions for what the axion mass might be from other places, because then you could just go and detect it. Um, but you don't know the mass and that's what makes the game so hard. So how, how do you do all this? What, what do you detect? What's the power? This is what you detect. So this is one way that I like to see it, but I think it's quite simple. It's not, a, it's not in the same rigor of the calculations that they do to make their, their predictions. But let's just linearize Maxwell's equations in the presence of a background magnetic field. We know then that we get a wave equation for E, E double dot minus squared squared E. That would normally be zero. So I just have waves um, for the electric field. But in the presence of the axion, I have a source term. Um, I think this should be phi, not phi squared. Yes, this should be phi on the right hand side. So I have a source term proportional to the axion photon coupling and the axion field. The axion field oscillates at this frequency cosine omega t, where omega is the axion mass plus or minus the um, velocity dispersion in the galaxy, which is very small. So this is a very narrow band um, oscillating source. But now you've just got you know, a, a wave equation with an oscillating source. You know how to solve that. And, what, and the trick is to make this gradient term give you a resonance. Um, give you a resonance. So you know, go to k space minus grand squared goes to k squared. If you now so now you want to fix the k, try and fix the k vector in your electric field. So you restrict it inside a cavity, give it some boundary conditions. 
then we know that the electric field inside of this cavity can only live this frequency in one decade or this frequency. And so this is lambda over 2, which you can use to work out k. So you restrict your electric field by boundary conditions, you fix k. Now you've just got a resonant oscillator and the electric field should just grow. In the perfect case, it would grow without bound. Of course, in reality, we always have losses. So you've got some losses at the walls of your cavity. And that implies that you have some finer quality factor Q. So you just work out resonant solutions of this equation. In the 1D case, you know, you can just, you can just use, write down the solutions from, say, Goldstein for a resonant oscillator with a quality factor. Um, in, the, in the 3D case, you have to solve for the resonant frequencies of your cavity numerically using something like ComSol. And then you have to work out the, the power output also using some, kind of, using some kind of 3D simulation software. Okay? But you can do that. Again, in the 1D case, let's just say, let's just say what, what we get. Um, so you know that the power output from a resonantly driven oscillator is just omega over Q times the energy stored. The energy stored goes like the electric field squared, which goes like the axial field squared times the quality factor squared. So you get omega over Q times, you know, Q squared rho dark matter times some other things. Okay, so we've got two powers of the axial coupling. We've got the dark matter density, which is phi squared. So this thing has to go like axial coupling squared times one power of Q times rho dark matter. Okay? Then you have some constant C that you have to compute numerically for your given system by solving, by using console, basically. Um, okay, so the power output for some reference parameters ends up being about 10 to the minus 21 watts, which is incredibly small power. And this is for a quality factor of, say, 10 to the 6, which is, um, which is about as good as you can get because you've got a limit on your, quality, on your maximum quality factor from the dispersion of the axion, from the velocity dispersion of the galaxy. So you can have a Q of, of at most 10 to the 6. This is your power. Okay, but you could just wait for a really long time. So you, so you just sit on this frequency, wait, your signal builds up, you detect it. But you can only wait for so long because you don't know the axion frequency. So they just wait until they get down to the QCD line and they move on to the next frequency. That's basically, that's why, they, why the constraints always follow the QCD line for the NX. So you'd like to work out the signal to noise for this. So, you, so to do this, you use the Dickey radiometer equation with noise power going like um, Boltzmann's constant times T, where T is the effective noise temperature. But the noise now in the Dickey radiometer equation goes like the square root of the um, frequency dispersion divided by the integration time. So this is why you can always increase your signal to noise by integrating for longer. So your signal power, um, so your signal then goes like power times time. That's the, that's the energy that you're measuring. But your noise only goes like one over square root time. So overall, your signal to noise increases like square root of time. That's because it's square root n, right? Signal to noise always increases like square root n. And then in this case, the number of trials is basically the, um, given by the time. Okay, so you have a trade-off between bandwidth and total range scanned. Um, but you just sit on the frequency and integrate. And then this is how ADMX work out their constraint. So they did some constraints here um, in, in a few early runs that where they just chose to go down to the KSVZ line and then they've recently done a couple of scans all the way down to DFSC. Um, okay, so ADMX have, have, set the, have set the bar. They are the only experiment that has constrained the QCD axiom at DFSC sensitivity as a dark matter candidate, but they've done it only, only over a very narrow range in the last in the last couple of years. So the halo scope, it, the RF cavity is um, a very important concept and it can be developed um, and try and exchange, 
make this range bigger, build other cavities in other places that are at different frequencies. You know, more cavities can scan more quickly. Uh, so this is the idea. Um, so I'm going to tell you now a little bit about the development on this side. So RF cavity developments. So for example, um, a smaller cavity at Yale has been built called Haystack, um, which uses squeezed vacuum states to reduce the noise. Um, ADMX also have various plans called ADMX HF to work at higher frequencies. Um, the organ experiment in Australia um, is, is also being commissioned and done some, some runs with a fixed cavity frequency, high frequencies. Um, yeah, shown on here isn't that Haystack have also done some results at fixed cavity frequencies. So there are various things that have happened here. This whole R&D plan in the US um, and with, with ADMX and their various upgrades, Orpheus, Sidecar, all of these things that they have planned, will be able to carve out this big region here on the plane that we've seen. And um, all these other results, all these other halo-scopes here that have only come down to different frequencies, these are the Brookhaven and University of Florida, you know, 1980s and early 1990s halo-scopes. And um, they could never run them for long enough to get down to the QCD line, but they did all of the R&D that showed that this could happen. And so here's a picture of, um, I think this is a picture of Haystack, um, and showing how they will do. And then this is um, now showing what I mentioned before, the Supernova 1987A bound, which excludes the QCD axion um, along its line um, from, the, from the, I think it's the arrival of the neutrino burst from Supernova 1987A. And then here is showing you the hot dark matter of the So The QCD axion lives down here. Haloscopes will do well, but they still can't, they, they tank out a few tenths of a, of a milli EV because you're trading off against volume. You, can't, you just can't build an effective cavity. At small, you can't make it smaller and smaller and smaller. You could make it really small and use lots of cavities, but then coupling the modes becomes really hard. When cavities get very small, you know, terahertz is millimeter, millimeter waves. You're then talking about tiny things that you're then trying to tune. So you'd have to have moving parts on millimeter scales at like sub Kelvin temperatures. Haloscopes become, traditional cavity haloscopes become, start to become infeasible um, at, at high axion masses. And then at low axion masses, they just can't get the volume of magnetic field. So more needs to be done. And that will be the subject of the next lecture up here and down here. There's a little bit more to say this lecture about haloscopes. I've already talked about the uh, Center for Axion Precision Fit axion and precision physics in Korea. Um, I was there last November or December, no sorry, September. Last September I was there and the uh, Cosmo Cosmology Conference was in, in Daejeon as well and I went, went around for a day and visited CAP. Um, so Yanis Smertidis is a director there. He was involved um, in the early Haloscope experiments in the 80s. And then he worked on EDMs for a long time. Um, in the US, I believe, at Brookhaven. Um, and then he got appointed director of this institute in, in, in Korea. Um, Ginny, Ginny Kim, um, Kim of the KSVZ Axiom model, was instrumental in getting the funding for this center from the Korean government. Um, so it's an entire center devoted to Axiom experiments and R&D. So they've got a huge experiment hall, um, you know, many times the size of this room, with loads and loads of dilution refrigerators in it. And then um, that's where they're building Ariadne and they're doing loads of R&D for new cavities. Um, so you can try and get higher frequency and larger volume of cavity by having a coupled cavity. So they I mean, they literally just have these cavities lying around on desks everywhere. Like the desks of everyone in this, in this place are covered in uh, copper cavities and they've just got like, dilution refrigerators everywhere. Um, it, it's amazing, it's amazing about the investment. So this is what they look like. Um, sorry, my, my phone took really blurry pictures this day. Um, so here's a cavity um, that you can't quite see here. There's a rod. In, there's a rod inside there. The rod is um, not see. The rod is almost clear, um, but it's made of sapphire. I only learned here that, that pure sapphire isn't blue. 
it's completely clear. It's clear. And they use sapphire because of the dielectric properties. Here's a cavity called the pizza cavity. And um, because that now th this cavity has four seg segments. And if you have four segments, the natural frequency of your cavity is higher. But if you can engineer it correctly, you can couple all of the modes so that the volume is still large. So you can have larger volume at higher frequency. So this, is how, this is how you're trying to push the cavity technology to higher and higher frequencies. Um, of course, you do lots of engineering and modeling and, and measurements on these. They've tested out four, six segment cavity. Um, but they, they want to go to, I think, eight or 16 segments, but it becomes very hard to tune. It's a big engineering problem, but it's an engineering problem, and not necessarily a physics problem. Here's a sample cavity hanging down in the way the ADMX one does um, with all its tuning rods, and it will be enclosed in a dilution refrigerator like this one here. So they've got all the kit, they're doing all the R&D, and um, they'll make some very good progress again in the, in the coming decades. Cavities um, and axial experiments are really cool from an astrophysical point of view. If the dark matter is an axion and we detect it, we can learn a lot about um, astrophysics because with, say, a WIMP experiment, you make your big container um, of liquid xenon and you wait for WIMPs to come in. It's not resonance. So you would just detect WIMPs of any mass as long as they're in that um, curve that we showed. You would detect them, but all you do is you wait and you say a flash. There's nothing you can do to then learn much more about it. I mean, there is directional dark matter detection and things like this, but it's generally very hard and you're stuck at just that, at that rate. With the axiom, because you've tuned to it, once you've tuned to it, it's just there. And, and then you can learn about your signal by scanning the shape of that peak really, really finely. And the shape of the, of the peak contains all the information about the galactic velocity dispersion. So um, I wrote down already this equation. So the axiom field will oscillate from the frequency um, omega t. Omega is centered around the axial mass, but it's really determined by, by the velocity dispersion. So it's really ma plus v squared. Uh, and the number is ma times 1 plus v squared times t. So delta omega over omega goes like the velocity dispersion, but the, the shape of the peak contains all the velocity information about the local dark matter. So you can use that to do astronomy. So this is um, a sketch, um, well this is a, a proper plot that I'm showing, sketching the idea from a paper by Kieran O'Hare and Anne Green from two years ago. And so, so Kieran modeled modeled this axion line shape, the whole shape of this spectrum, um, and showed how it would change. It would also have this peak would have annual modulation, like by, by the motion of the Earth around the sun, there's components to this velocity dispersion in the local motion, relative to the galactic rest frame, and the whole shape of it contains all this information. So here you see the power in you it's 10 to the minus 22 watts, which we're familiar with. Here's the frequency, central frequency minus the axion mass here in kilohertz. So here it is. Here's the annual modulation, for example, in the axion signal. But also, just the fine structure of this measures all kinds of things about the, um, about the velocity dispersion. And so here's another plot by, um, from that paper. Uh, by O'Hare and Green. The line shape contains all of the phase space information. So he's showing here um, for different amounts of integration time once you've discovered the axion, how well you measure the axion mass and the coupling. And he's done this for, um, for, for mock data, so he knows the right answer. So in 10 days, you don't know the axion mass and um, perfectly because of the annual modulation. You know it with a large error and a bias, but as you integrate for longer, you get a better and better measurement of the axion mass. But you also learn about the galactic velocity dispersion and the lab frame motion. So 
Again, you don't know this very well initially with only 10 days of integration time, but within a year of integration time, you know the lab frame velocity and the velocity dispersion and the local velocity dispersion very well. So once you detect the axiom, you can use it to do astronomy, which is really, really cool. It's not, it's not something you could do if the dark matter was one. So if the dark matter is an axiom, it's a boom for astronomers um, because you can just learn a lot more about the dark matter. Um, that's all I have um, in this set of slides today. Um, but as we've got another 20 minutes, I'm just going to start my slides from tomorrow and then we'll finish early tomorrow if we can because the, these, these topics just lead on to each other. So I'm just going to start my slides from tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right. So um, I don't know about the old um, RBF and new, the new Florida ones, um, but for ADM X, it does go up and down. And um, because I guess it works all the way up. Ah, okay. So here it goes all the way up here yeah. and all the way up here. So, so it goes. So this is between experiments. Yeah. So, so, so this is ADM X. There's no gaps in ADM X. Then this is let's say RBF. No gaps, and there's a gap between RBF and New Florida. So the gaps where it goes all the way up to no constraint are because they're different experiments that haven't met each other yet. Well, you've seen the same experiment. It's been, but to me, the only half is it's not the resonance that's you know, it's really like just a green region. Yeah, it's a green region, and it has some blocky structure okay, because of the cool. scans. And if I showed like more exactly the stru structure, it's because of. Uh, it's to do with all kinds of things like modeling of backgrounds, you know, back, um, like background noise. It doesn't make it a pair. They're not cheating, they're not counting too far, so they need to. No, they, they always join their, yeah. join their resonant regions. Yeah. Um, they have some finite bandwidth, which gives you just a block, and then the scans join the blocks. Yeah, and, and, and the gaps are between experiments. And um, one of the career experiments, um, one of the experiments in Dijon, and they built their prototype to sit exactly on this gap between RBF and New Florida. Um, because yeah, those two experiments didn't meet and they stopped running for whatever reason. Um, and they built their experiment to sit exactly there and fill the gap. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm just gonna carry on uh, into, into my next slides. So let's stop the share there. Let's open a new PowerPoint. So just moving on to lecture 10. Um, okay. So we've talked a lot about RF cavities and we've shown that they can do a lot, but they have this limited bandwidth. You're not going to get much below a, below a gigahertz, and you're not going to get much above a, um, you know, a few hundred gigahertz. So in terms of axial mass, you're not going to get much below a micro EV, and you're not going to get much above 100 micro EV. So what do we need to do to, to, to fill that in? Um, so I call this the, the haloscope new wave. So there was just, there's just been a huge flurry of activity in inventing new axion experiments in the last 10 years. And, this is, and many of these have been built and are in their initial commissioning or are, or are going to be built. And that's what did this whole filling up of the parameter space that I showed a few slides ago. So the radio frequency haloscopes are limited in their dynamic range. You can't go too big because you can't make a big crack Energetic volume and fill the magnetic field. You can't go too small because the power drops and you, you, you have trouble controlling the resonant frequencies. And furthermore, all of these classic axion experiments, like shining through a wall, heliscopes, halo scopes, only probe the axion photon coupling. 
So you wouldn't actually, you can't remove the, especially with the halo scope, you can't remove the degeneracy between row dark matter. So the signal strength is constrained on the coupling. It's not really fair to put the halo scopes on the same plot as like shining through a wall and helioscopes. Because helios the halo scopes are only sensitive to the dark matter density. They're sensitive to square root of the dark matter density times g. So if the dark matter density was zero, the halo scopes would detect them. But if the axion density was zero, if the dark matter was something else, the axion the halo scopes don't detect them again. Also, if the halo scope makes a detection, you don't know whether you've measured g um, at the local dark matter density 0.4 GeV per centimeter cube, or whether you've measured a more strongly coupled axion that's making up less of the dark matter. You can't do any model discrimination. You only measure one coupling. You can't know what you've seen. So you also would like to build halo scopes that measure couplings other than the axial photon coupling. So yeah, so the halo scope, the RF, RF halo scope that measures G phi gamma, it would be nice to have a halo scope that measures G phi nuclei, say. And, um, and we'll see that there are such ones. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through some of these until I run out of time and we'll pick up tomorrow. The new ideas where are needed. Um, and they really kind of kicked off. There were, there were two groups of people who kicked off with a load of ideas. There is a paper in, I think it's 2013, by um, Peter Graham and Sajit Rajendran, um, both in the Bay Area, Sajit at Berkeley and Peter um, at Stanford. And they wrote this, this paper, I think, new, new Ideas in Searching for Axion Dark Matter. And they came up with axion, axion, searches for axion nucleon coupling, searches for dipole moments. And um, they said they couldn't come up with anything for the electron coupling, but they made us all think about it. And um, this piqued everyone's interest. And there was also a load of papers around that same time um, by Yevgeny Stadnik and Victor Flambaum um, at the, um, in Australia. And they discussed all kinds of new constraints on axion couplings, often from, um, often from astrophysics, but making us think about magnetometry and axions. And these sets of papers came out and made everybody go, okay, let's figure out new axion searches, I think. And one of the, one of the things that came up from that and significant for us here in Germany was the um, Mad Max proposal for the so-called dielectric telescope. Um, the Mad Max Interest Group published this in 2017. The, some of the original ideas go back also to this kind of early birth in 2013 um, using, dish, using a dish antenna. Um, to search for axions and related particles. So, yeah, how, how does this Mad Max idea work? So you have a you, coherent um, electromagnetic radiation is produced at a dielectric boundary if you have um, an axion field. So this, um, I, I'm, I'm taking some slides from a review of this, when I review all the technical calculations um, all the technical calculations for this were done in a paper by Alex Miller. Um, and I'm taking this diagram from the paper by Miller. So, okay, we've got, we, we just solve electrodynamics in the presence of this axion field. It's classic, you know, um, like Jackson um, or even earlier um, undergraduate e and problem. So you have region one, region two, the two different dielectric constants. And you just match the boundary conditions, but in the presence now of a source, so the axion induces an electric field in region one with some value E1, um, and it induces an electric field in region two with a different value E2 because they have different dielectric constants. But we know that the, um, the field at the boundary has to, has to match. So you get an, an, a further field induced at the boundary. Um, so the axion field is in orange, E1 and E2. So then you have to induce new fields at the boundary in black, E1 gamma and E2 gamma, to make sure that the, feet, that the overall field balances. This in turn means that you induce an H field perpendicular on the boundary. So you have an E and H field on the boundary perpendicular to each other. So that causes a photon to get emitted in the boundary from balancing the field, from just, just from balancing the boundary conditions. Of course, we're applying a magnetic field here to have the axion photon conversion. So the axion creates an electric field 
that isn't propagating because it has E parallel to B, E dot B, but the presence of the dielectric boundary converts that E field that isn't propagating into a propagating field with non-zero K vector with, pe with perpendicular E and B a propagating photon. Now what you can do if you're clever is you can have many dielectric boundaries and arrange them in such a way that the photons that arrive from one field, from one boundary, are in phase with the photons that arrive from the last boundary. So you write, um, Alex came up with this clever transfer matrix formalism for what happens if I have lots of different regions of different dielectric constants, how to match all of the phases between your axions from them, depending on the distance between your disks. You then stick a mirror on the other end, make the process happen again, and point it also a microwave receiver. So it's kind of like a resonance, but you can show that this doesn't have to be resonant to have an enhancement. So this is the limits of the microwave cavity. The microwave cavity is just two mirrors and vacuum photons, and you make the process resonant, and then you pump them out via the, um, via the boundary through, via the losses through the walls of the cavity. But here you can basically modify the resonant, the resonant frequencies of the cavity, and it's not always resonant. And so you choose your dielectric, write, you change your spacings. It's still a scanning procedure. You still have to scan at different frequencies, um, but you shift, up, you, you shift up in the frequencies that are accessible to you. And so Mad Max isn't just a theorist cartoon like this. It's under R&D. Um, there's been a prototype, a very small prototype, just to test the ID, the, um, some, of the, some of the basic ideas has been built in Munich. Um, the full experiment um, will be built at DAISY. I believe it's, um, I believe it's completely funded. Um, big group of experimentalists now working on this. And here are some diagrams from it. Um, so this is the test of the idea. Um, it's already been built in Munich. Here are these dielectrics. They're disks of sapphire. These are small, um, relatively small disks of sapphire. In the full experiment, these will be meter squared scale disks of sapphire. There'll be, 90, there'll be 80, or 80 to 100 of them. So it's huge, huge amounts of stuff. 80 to 100 meter squared disks of pure sapphire. Um, and the, and th that's actually one of the problems they're going to face is manufacturing these disks of sapphire because they're quite thin. And to make them that big, you need to stick lots of them together. And then you have to model how they're stuck together and how that affects your resonant frequencies. So it's a big engineering problem, big, big fabrication problem, but that's what they're building. 80 meter squared disks of uh, pure, pure sapphire. They have to then encase that whole thing in a gigantic magnet and hang it from something so that they can move their disks. That's why it's going to daisy, going to daisy because they have the infrastructure to deal with these kind of things. And they're going to use, again, an old piece of HERA um, to hang the disks from and move it. Um, so they've got a, cart um, a, a, a picture from an, a supplier of what the magnet would look like. Um, so this is a design for the magnet from these magnet suppliers. Um, the, some hundreds of kilograms. Um, this is why I like 35 meters of superconducting cable. Oh, sorry, 35,000 meters. This is using there. Uh, Jeremy, thank you. 35 kilometers of superconducting cable to make this magnet. This is the cost of this experiment. The cost in axion experiments is always magnet. The future is a bigger magnet. I heard Lin Lin Lindsay Winslow um, of the Abracadabra experiment that we hear about next time. Um, she talked about, she said, in axion experiments, the future is a bigger magnet. This is, this is your magnet. Here's your person. This is how big this thing is. Here's your, 80, here's your 80 sapphire disks. Here's your 35 kilometers of superconducting wire. The, the whole thing has to be cooled to two Kelvin. I mean, it's a massive, massive undertaking. Wouldn't be, they, they wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't going to be worthwhile. And this is why it's going to be worthwhile. So um, this is the forecast for what um, Mad Max can do from Alex, from Alex Miller's paper. He's turned around the parameter space a bit. Um, so that now the QCB axion is a straight line. So it's, it's a function of this dimensionless coupling C. Now, so he's written this basically for uh, QCB axions. So now the mass and decay constants sit along the same axis. 
The KSVZ model is 1.92, the FSC is minus 0.8. So here are the models. And now here's ADMX, the Brookhaven models. Here are the upgrades to ADMX that will get down to KSVZ. Here's the proposed the career experiments, cool task, they're called in this case. You also go here, but they tank out. But the dielectric kaleidoscope Mad Max with 80 <laughs> discs will be able to get down to DFSC like sensitivities at about a factor of 10 higher in mass than the, um, than the traditional kaleidoscopes. So they'll be able to get you up to the K constants, about 10 to the 11 masses. So here is about 100 micro EV, masses up to 200 micro EV. This is the ballpark of where you expect the axion to lie in the post-inflation PQ breaking scenario. So if you take this string decay stuff seriously, this is where the axion should be, and that's why, why, why Mad Max aims for that frequency. But they still don't get all the way up to, 10 to the map, up to the bounds from the axon. They still tank out, and that's something I'll talk about next time, um, how you can maybe push this to even higher frequencies, these kinds of ideas. Um, and of course, we talked about uh, mini clusters last time and, and also in Jens's lecture. This is the ballpark of where you expect to be if the dark matter is um, produced by this post inflation PQ scenario. But the modeling assumes that it's completely homogeneous. So the modeling for the dark matter, for the signal here in Mad Max, neglects the fact that a large fraction of this dark matter could be bound up in mini clusters. That's why it's very important to understand mini clusters in this scenario. If all of the dark matter is bound up in mini clusters, these guys would, you'd expect to collide with a mini cluster like once every few hundred years, and these guys would just not see anything. But if a significant portion of your mini clusters are not, are not too dense, then they can get tidally disrupted, and then you've got loads of free axions again, and then this signal would re-emerge. But then you wouldn't see anything in micro lenses. <laughs> So this role of mini clusters, their density, how tidally stripped do they get, is key to saying, can we see them in gravitational microlensing? How much should we see? Can we see them in, ex in experiments like Mad Max? How much should we see? Because, okay, the axiom could exist down here in the pre-inflation scenario as well, and then all of these searches are fine. But then there's no prediction for the mass. In the case where you can try and predict the mass, to live here, mini clusters are just the bane of your life. So all of these experiments would see something in the pre in the pre-inflation PQ scenario. Axion feels nice and smooth. Post-inflation PQ scenario, you have to be in this high, higher mass regime, but mini clusters, anybody's guess. So that's why they're um, it's a very it's a very important and interesting regime. There's lots of work going on there, um, but mini clusters. I might get in the way. So I'll stop there today and tomorrow we'll pick up with more of the Paloscope new wave. And um, before I stop, um, questions about axion searches. We've covered a lot today. Yeah. If you have the So if you had like two different axions and they would mix with each other. And oscillate. Yeah, all of these experiments assume that there's just one axion. If there's more than one, if there's something new you could do with the flavor oscillations, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. I mean, just naively, if there's more than one, then all these experiments say the square root row, and each one would expect to see, you know, we'd have to go further below the QCD line to see anything. Um, but actually, from the interactions of the axions between themselves, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know at all. It would certainly affect the helioscopes because if only if you produce that's interesting. If you produce you know some flavor eigenstate of the axion, which is the one that interacts with e dot b both in the sun and here but then it oscillates out of that flavor state, then you would detect less of it. So it could even affect the helioscope bounds. Yeah, interesting. Never, 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 never heard anyone talk about it before.
dealers can also have pocket and send it to the player. Or why would they be there? Let's say oh, let's say you produce the axion via its axion, you play an interaction, but you detect it via its axion photon interaction. You produce it in an action nucleon eigenstate could oscillate, and then the one that interacts with the photon that you detect it by would be would be different. So it would be that it would be similar to neutrinos. I think like some of the axions would go missing if you had different eigenstates that you're detecting and producing it. I suppose you, you could think of the halo scope problem in the same way. Like I produce them all via a via vacuum realignment. That's like some I can stay, but only one linear combination of them couples to E dot B. So you get some suppression by, you can only detect one linear combination. Um, but that's the way I said it is quite a naive way of looking at it. Any other questions about axion detection? Okay, good. Um, well, we'll stop there for today. Tomorrow, um, you all get a lie in because there's no lecture from Jens. I'll send a note on Studio IP so everybody gets that. Um, and then we'll start here um, at quarter past 10 and we'll finish, finish axion searches. Cool. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.